One of the most uh, revealing and striking moments in the debate was when the former president of the United States was asked whether he wanted Ukraine to win, to win its defensive war against a rapacious uh, neighbor. And uh, he would not say yes. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Wall Street Journal and the Brookings Institution, Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center, and Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Notes from the Middle Ground. Our special guest this week is Matt Bennett, who is Executive Vice President for Public Affairs at Third Way. And so welcome one and all. We're going to spend a little time dissecting the eating pets debate. <laughs> That's my shorthand for what happened on Tuesday night. Um, so, let us begin with uh, our guest, Matt. Um, Matt, the um, I guess the first thing, the only thing you needed to know about how badly it went for Trump was that even as the debate was ongoing, people on the right were screaming in outrage about the moderators. Yeah, it was a horrific night for Trump. And and look, um, Scott Jennings, who you know does his best to stand up for Trump on on CNN, had a great line. He said, "You don't get to complain about the refs if you can't hit your jump shot." And the problem for Trump yeah. was he just was awful. He's he's almost always awful in debates. Um, the Harris campaign did a good job of promoting how skilled he was after seven of these things, but he's terrible at debating and. Uh, that came through loud and clear, despite the fact that everyone in the political world, including my 22-year-old son, knew what Harris was going to do. Trump certainly knew. He fell for it anyway. It was unbelievable. It was. I mean, that's one of the things that I was just going to mention to Bill, which is this is the these were the most telegraphed punches in history, they, they, t I don't know why they did that, but they told all on sundry that they were going to attempt to bait him to get under his skin. And when she did it, now let's give Harris full credit here. She did it with great skill. Um, but, um, but still, uh, it, you know, it was so obvious and yet Trump could not help himself. Could he, Bill? He couldn't help himself falling. For example, we're being a little abstract. The first way she needled him was by saying, I, I advise you to go to a Trump rally where you will find that people are leaving halfway through. They're exhausted and they're bored. Um, and that was a, a wound to his ego that he couldn't let slide. That was the first one. But it just kept on going and going. <laughs> and going, going and going, indeed. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's really not clear to me what I can add to this general pylon. Uh, you know how many way how many different ways can we find of say uh, saying he was awful uh and he you know i can't think of a single way in which he helped himself not one uh and if i you know and i'm trying to figure out who would watch that debate and say well i was undecided but i've now switched i'm going to back up trump uh and uh, i suppose such people exist uh, but there are not very many of them, and they will have a hard time explaining themselves. Uh, and uh, you know, if I were if I were the Trump managers, I would not allow him to debate again. Period. Full stop. Uh, and I would, you know, and I would transact all of my business with paid media, where if he appears, he appears in a scripted form, you know, delivering the message that he was completely incapable of delivering uh, when he was there without a teleprompter. You know, there was all this chatter in advance of how Kamala, you know, would be 
you turned into a producer of word salad answer, absent the teleprompter. Well, guess who turned into the producer of worlds of word salad absent absent the teleprompter? And I really, I really think he ought to spend a hundred percent of his time between now and election day at his rallies, where he can do no damage to his campaign uh, and and the and the rest of the campaign's effort, if it wants to remain competitive, you know, should be you know highly scripted and paid for. Okay, Linda, I'm going to be devil's advocate here. Um, the you know we are all inside the Beltway pundit types. We are not in touch with average people. What do we know? The fact is, the New York Times found some undecided voters who had watched the debate and said they came out more inclined to vote for Trump uh, based on on what they saw. So those people do exist, and the. Um, the outcome is not so clear, you know, for, based on us, you would think that after that debate, she she would shoot up by 20 points in the uh, in the in the head to head. But that nobody thinks that's going to happen. Well, right. Let, let me let me make a couple of responses. One is that, you know, we're all sitting here laughing about the, you know, your pet, uh, uh, your chihuahua from next door is being eaten by a Haitian immigrant. Um, but the fact is they are doubling down on that narrative. They are actually sending people to Springfield, Ohio, and they are trying to find evidence. And they've come up with some videos uh, like purporting to show, show what are supposedly Haitian immigrants. They are black people. It's not at all clear they're Haitians uh, carrying geese. Um, and uh, they're claiming they were taken from a park, etc. So this is the problem. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, there is a segment of the American public, the people who believe UFOs are real, and we've had you know alien space invasions that created Stonehenge and other uh, things around the world, who will buy this stuff. And because it is particularly racist, it also appeals. Uh, to the xenophobia and to the, frankly, just old-fashioned racism that uh, Trump has always trafficked in. So I do think, uh, you know, I think we have to be careful here. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton got into a lot of trouble when she talked about the basket of deplorables. And there are people out there who believe these stories, and that is who he is trying to appeal to. Now, will that sway college-educated suburban women in Bucks County, Pennsylvania? I doubt it. But he, uh, this, this is not an accident that he pushed this story. It's not an accident that J.D. Vance has gone on. He's pulled back a little bit saying, well, we haven't yet found, you know, hard evidence, but, you know, they are looking. And um, it's, it is really scary because it does, I think, exemplify what is so dangerous about this man. And we can all laugh and think it was pretty amusing. Um, I just want to make one other point. You talked about um, the complaints about the fact checkers on ABC. To my recollection, they fact checked him three times. One was about the, you know, stealing pets and eating them uh, by Haitian immigrants. Uh, the other time they fact checked him was on his assertion that there is a mad, you know, I guess, wide scale infanticide going on and that Democrats, uh, including he misidentified the West Virginia uh, governor as advocating uh, for babies to be killed after they were born if their mothers had wanted an abortion. And then the third thing they fact checked him on was his winning the 2020 election. I don't know how you can complain about fact checking on that. Th these are not fact checking on policy proposals and whether a policy proposal is good or bad. These are out and out lies, scandalous lies. And I think it would have been uh, really um, an abrogation of duty if ABC had not tried to fact check him on that. Damon, you're a good person to talk about this, uh, this aspect of it, because one of the ways you can interpret both the lead up to the debate and the debate itself, the lead up being J.D. Vance and members of MAGA circulating the pet eating story, uh, and then Trump 
you know, swallowing it, if you don't mind the uh, <laughs> image here, uh, <laughs> and regurgitating it back uh, on the debate stage, um, is that MAGA has become, it always was, but it's even more so now, it is, it exists inside its own little bubble. It's very online. It, um, it, it creates fictions, tells these fictions to itself, and, uh, and, and gets more and more riled up about the fictions they're telling themselves. And, but at this moment, arguably, at the debate, what happened was it came tumbling out into the normal discourse and people were sort of, you know, just taken aback that this kind of lunacy, um, you know, was introduced as a fact. Right. Well, I mean, it is, it is a complicated phenomenon. I mean, base mobilization campaigns in a general election were started, I think, pretty much by George W. Bush in 2004, where Karl Rove, you know, got it, uh, got the idea that if we put, um, all these ballot initiatives in the states about uh, banning gay marriage, then that would gin up turnout in the general election and Bush would win. Well, he did end up winning. I don't know what portion of that win can be attributed to that strategy. But the Republicans have gone down that road so far by this point that they now have for the third cycle in a row a candidate who really is incapable of speaking in any kind of rhetoric or language or cultural references that do not derive from the fever swamps of the online right-wing media uh, uh, culture. And, and of course, that, that media culture has moved further and further right and further and further into conspiratorialism over the last three cycles. So it's much worse now than it was in 2016. So you end up with this situation where Trump, who flew in to the debate uh, on a plane with Laura, Laura Loomer, who is a complete conspiratorial nutcase who probably was feeding him this kind of garbage on the plane in addition to the stuff that he's picked up from watching uh, Fox and OAN and Newsmax and all of these different outlets. And the result is this comes tumbling out of his mouth as if this is just true and the rest of the, the country and the moderators and Kamala Harris looking at him, like unbelieving uh, in her good luck to be standing on a debate stage opposite this guy, is saying this thing that makes him sound like a complete lunatic. But the, 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 the final point I'll say on this to point to the complexity of it is even though I am in the Kamala Harris silo, and I do think it is a larger silo, it is still a silo. And it might be a silo that's much more open to empirical refutation on the basis of evidence and scientific reasoning. And I do believe that. And I think that I would defend that very strongly to those on the right who want to say, no, you're just as hoodwinked by lies and conspiracies. But it is true that what we saw the other night was two candidates speaking to almost completely different electorates. Um, they are not addressing the same voters. And then in between the two camps, there are these few swing voters <laughs> who really are persuadable to go one way or the other, but they also tend to be the least informed, uh, the least aware of policy detail, and so the least able to be wooed by traditional electoral appeals. And it, I think that is where you end up with things like that New York Times focus group, where some people are like, yeah, I think Trump did better. I'm going to vote for him now. After eight years of this, I was uncertain which way I'd go. But after watching that debate, I've decided it is Trump after all. Like, <laughs> I live in a world in which someone thinking that way 
is inconceivable. I simply cannot imagine how a human being could could reason that way about the world. And yet, the Times found a few of them right there, and that means there are more of them. Now, not tons of them, because most people are already in one or the other camp. And a lot of the cheering that we've heard in the subsequent days, and I've been one of them, saying, you know, she did great, and we'll hopefully get to some of that, because uh, yep. Kamala Harris is pretty much my ideal down. Democrat <laughs> uh, at this point. Uh, it can't get better than this. Um, but but yet, you know, of course, I'm in I'm in the group of voters who 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 liked her before and like her even more now. And I'm cheering her on. But, you know, on the other side, you got the Trumpers who are like, yeah, some of them think he did great. Others think he did bad, but they don't care. Um, and so there is a, a real kind of the, the echo chambers are real, even if some echo chambers are much more uh, appealing to me than others. Uh, Matt, I'm going to take a slightly different tack from Damon here because I actually think that Harris went quite a ways toward trying to appeal to people who were undecided or people who are in the middle. I thought her presentation was incredibly centrist. She didn't sound at all like a left wing or a progressive Democrat in that debate. It was all right smack right over home plate in terms of centrism. What do you think? I could not agree more. I mean, my organization, Third Way, it, we are the moderate Democrats. Six years ago, we made these buttons. I am an opportunity Democrat. I mean, we, we've been talking <laughs> about opportunity economics for a long time. It was, and, and this was true of her convention speech as well. When I walked out of the convention hall, yep. Jonathan Martin, a Politico, walked up to me and said, did you write that speech? I mean, she is... She is <laughs> right on the money as far as we're concerned. And I'm delighted to hear that that's true of the center right kind of never Trump world as well. And I, I, you know, Bill Crystal told me the same thing. So I think she is, uh, I give her an A plus on her narrative and messaging. The one thing they stuck a toe out a little too far around grocery prices, and then they yanked it back um, when they got the toe chopped off uh, by a whole bunch of records. Explain, explain. Well, so they, they leaked uh, some policy about three weeks ago, uh, which sounded like price controls for groceries. And among other people, yeah. Catherine Rampell of the Washington Post wrote a blistering column. And she is very, you know, she's a center left um, economic thinker. Yes. And she was right. I mean, the, the, the idea of price controls is idiotic and, and they immediately changed course. So I went on Fox the next morning and I called the campaign and said, I'm going to get killed on Fox, uh, tomorrow. What do I say? And they said, this isn't price controls. This is really about antitrust enforcement. So they, they immediately kind of dialed back when to adjust for going too far left that's basically it. That's that's really the only thing they've done that that has been even mildly, uh, you know, kind of liberal in the in the bad sense of that word. And I think um, they are clearly aiming for the right group of voters. I agree with all the others on here saying that the undecided voter, a very small segment. Uh, the campaign numbers showed at about seven percent. That may be a little high. That's national. Um, so it's a tiny group. But boy, she was squarely aiming for them. Yep. Um, so, um, Bill, something that I know is near and dear to your heart and to mine um, is the question of American policy toward Ukraine. And um, one of the most uh, revealing and striking moments in the debate was when the former president of the United States was asked whether he wanted Ukraine to win to win its defensive war against a rapacious uh, neighbor. And uh, he would not say yes. He would not say yes. He said he wants the war to end. And then he went even further. And I'm sorry, I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a second. Fine, fine. We um, love it. <laughs> <laughs> because he went further and he, he then started invoking World War Three. Oh, he said it's going to be World War Three. The fact is that he has been, he's supposedly Mr. Strongman, you know, Mr. They're All Afraid of Me. He is the most intimidated man on the, on the planet when it comes to Putin's empty threats about using nuclear weapons. 
He is so terrified of Putin. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wrote a column about this this week where I contrasted him with, you know, I said, you know, Vladimir Putin found out that it's impossible to intimidate Volodymyr Zelensky. With Trump, it's exactly the opposite. Your comments. I'm off my soapbox. I was going to say, you ask great questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, what about that moment yeah, well, where, you know, we're yeah. talking about Ukraine and her positioning of herself as the pro-NATO, pro-Ukraine, pro-strong U.S. military role in the world, etc. Who could ask for anything more, as the yeah. song goes? Uh, look, uh, Trump had a much better argument available to him that would not be inconsistent with where he wants to end up. You know, he could say, sure, I want Ukraine to win. Everybody wants Ukraine to win. Unfortunately, they can't with the means that the West is willing to put at their disposal. And therefore, uh, the continuation of this war is pointless. Uh, it will lead to the same result, roughly speaking, no longer, no matter how long it goes on. And therefore, it would be in the interests of everybody to begin to explore a path to a negotiated settlement. There's, you know, look, we can agree or disagree with that argument, but it's an argument. Right? Yeah. And it, you know, and it may even turn out to be true in the long run. Uh, you know, I'm a member of a regularly meeting Ukraine study group. And I can't say there's an enormous amount of confidence in that group that uh, President Zelensky will ever be able to achieve the objectives to which he's committed his country. So this is, you know, uh, you know, this is an issue that calls for all of us to go beyond rhetoric and, you know, and look at facts and options, et cetera. But Trump found the worst possible way of making his argument. And if anybody cares about these things in the electorate, he deserves to pay a price for it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, because his, not only his capacitation, his capacity rather, you know, for intimidation was on full display, but also to put it as gently as possible, his moral emptiness. Right. Yes. I mean, I mean, there's sort of a moral shrug. Right. And uh, at, you know, at the at the end of the day, that vacuum where a moral sense belongs is the most conspicuous fact about him. And it comes out over and over and over again. Yeah, Linda, that's the that was the other piece of this, uh, which is <laughs> he goes immediately uh, after he worries about World War III and shows how easily intimidated he is, not that we should take Putin's nuclear weapons, you know, lightly, obviously, but he goes way too far. But then, you know, he pivots to the one thing that really he really does care about. He doesn't care about, you know, invasions, pillage, aggression, all that. He cares about money. He he has a, a cash register where his soul should be. And uh, and so he was very, um, very concerned about how much we're spending vis-a-vis -vis Europe. He got all the numbers wrong, um, of course. Um, but uh, but I'm I'm curious. So. Uh, you can comment on that if you want, but let, let's turn to Harris in the name of, uh, of balance here and note that she said some things that weren't true also. Um, she said, quote, as of today, there is not one member of the United States military who is in active duty in a combat zone in any war zone around the world. First time in this century. Well, that's not quite right. I mean, we have, we have people under arms and places that are dangerous, let's say, you know, uh, Iraq and Syria and other places. There have been some who've died in action against the Houthis. Um, so it's not that we we have nobody who's in harm's way. And maybe she didn't mean to suggest that. She also took out of context that bloodbath comment from Trump. Maybe, you know, that was slightly unfair. But, uh, you know, it, let's see. Trump, made the most outrageous, crazy um, uh, kinds of statements of fact, and she made one or two uh, overstatements. Right. <laughs> Hard yeah. to say. 
Yeah, no, it, I mean, look, uh, her her performance against a first rate debater um, would have looked somewhat differently than it did against Donald Trump. I mean, I think she uh, she did falter a bit. I thought when you know he started his strongest moment was at the start when he uh, began attacking the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. She was able to pivot very nicely and talk about his releasing 5,000 Taliban uh, warriors and uh, his inviting the Taliban uh, to Camp David. All of that was all well and good. I think it would have been good had she expressed uh, some sympathy for the 13 American soldiers who died. Um, It was just an oversight, I'm sure, on her part, but uh, I, I think it would have been um, that, that would have been helpful. And if she had some exaggerations, you know, the uh, worst um, unemployment uh, since the Great right. Depression. It was really since the Great Recession, Recession. which is different right. than yeah. the Great Depression. But again, those, those are the kind of mistakes people misspeak. I mean, who on this program hasn't misspoken once or twice uh, on the program, much less in life? So I yeah. give her. I give her very. High marks. What I give her the best marks on was her discipline in not biting in and um, you know going after him on some of his lies. I don't think I could have done it. I, frankly, I would have wanted to call him out. She chose not to do that, which was just as well because she had points she wanted to make that were positive points. She wanted to talk to the audience. Again, the audience that hadn't made up their mind. I mean, it wasn't an accident that she kept looking directly into the camera and saying things on the abortion issue, for example. I thought it was brilliant the way she started uh, in terms of talking about people whose faith and and beliefs uh, were different uh, on, on abortion. And she didn't say it exactly, but she's talking to a lot of religious Catholics and others who believe that abortion uh, is the taking of a human life, no matter when it occurs or under what circumstances it occurs. And she didn't want to get into an argument about that. She acknowledged that, but said even if you believe that, do you want the government and namely Donald Trump uh, making that decision uh, for you? And so I thought she pivoted very, very nicely. And that discipline in not getting bogged down in trying to answer each and every one of his lies uh, was fine because that, you know, that wasn't her job there. Her job was to introduce herself to the American public some 60 million or so of whom uh, saw her. And uh, this was a first uh, in-depth look at her, I'm sure for many of those people. And I think she did that very well. Yeah, she um, she she spoke to the American people right over his head. Right. right? And and just uh, was uh, was making uh, connections. And honestly, um, she was substantive. She had a lot of facts and finger, uh, figures at her fingers, including on, you know, uh, missiles and, you know, all kinds of things that showed, you know, she's mastered some of that commander and masculine stuff, stuff yes, commander right. in chief stuff. Yeah. So that was that was good. But she also then conveyed passion and empathy and she was relatable and she was likable. I mean, she was all the things that you want a candidate to be and all the thing that successful candidates tend tend to be. Um, but Damon, I'm going to give you a chance to criticize her because she did tap dance away from the question about her changing positions. Okay. So she was asked, you know, you, you changed your position on fracking and Medicare for all and uh, uh, one of the immigration and uh, and she said, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to all of those. But first, and then she went off on something else, and she never did come back to it. <laughs> she didn't give an explanation for her changed positions. Um, do you think that eventually that's going to, that, that, that sidestepping is going to run out and she's going to have to respond to that question? I'm not sure, given that she's up against Donald Trump. I I mean, a competent campaign would, in my opinion, take the following uh, line on her. It would not try to argue she's a crazy left winger or even as Trump keeps saying, a communist, a Marxist. He said from the (laughs) debate stage, like what? 
I it just so like so like ridiculous. It just it's it's uh, it has no substance to it and I think most Americans probably, even those who aren't inclined to like Kamala Harris, were like, well, what, a Marxist? What does that even mean in this day and age? So <clears throat> a competent campaign, I think, would be going not at her being too far to the left, but that you can't trust her because she held one set of views just right. four or five years ago. Now she says these other things. How <laughs> can we know what she'll do when she's in office? But Trump seems incapable of actually letting that critique. It, I guess, involves two motions of synapses, and he can only <laughs> handle one uh, in calling her a Marxist. So, I mean, if, if she were up against a better opponent, I think she would be forced to confront this issue much more directly. As it is, I'm not, I'm beginning to doubt it. I mean, when we first talked about her about a month ago when she first took over, I made a very strong case that she does have to give explanations for all of these things on fracking and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, ser you know, various environmental regulations and, and issues related to that. Uh, you know, some transgender comments and, and so forth and explain why she's changed her mind on each of them. And now I no longer think that she really should do that as long as she consistently holds to the new, more moderate positions that she staked out, she probably will be okay. And she has shown both in her convention acceptance speech and now in the debate, which had a very high rating, uh, it was a lot higher rating than the Biden-Trump debate. Yep. Um, as long as she keeps saying that, I think most people will just accept that that's what she's running on now. I yeah. even would go so far as to say that she should stop the line that I don't think is effective of I have the same values. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that I think, undermines the new position because it implies that, well, what I said five years ago is what I really would like to do, but yeah. now I'm uh, realizing that I can't, but my values still are back there in that wistful, better past when I could be on the left. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would just say, uh, you know, I've been vice president for three and a half years. I've learned a lot. And, and this, this is what I think is best. Say, yeah. I'm a pragmatist. Americans love a pragmatist. Exactly. Just say, yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yes. Yeah, say, yeah. I'm a pragmatist. I've, I've learned from experience. And these are the policies that are best for America. And I yeah. believe them. And that is what you can count on me to do and say as president of the United States. That's a very okay. powerful message. Yes. All right. One thing I want to put out there before we turn to our next topic, because um, David Muir raised this at the debate. It is very important, I think, about what we've all been through in the last um, three and a half years with Trump's lies about the 2020 election, which he repeated at the debate. Um, this is a an excerpt from an interview that he did, a podcast, uh, and he was asked about the results of the 2020 election. And let's listen to what he said. But I've done well with debates. I mean, I became president. Then the second time I got millions more votes than I got the first time. So I was told if I got 63 million, which is what I got the first time, you, you, you would win. You can't not win. And I got millions of more votes than that and uh, lost by a whisker. But... And look what happened to the world with all of the wars and all of the problems. He was asked about this at the debate, and he said uh, that he was being sarcastic when he used the term lost by a whisker. He obviously knows he lost. This is important for every American who was deluded uh, into uh, believing his lies. And it may very well turn out to be important in court cases uh, that will come up if he is not reelected. Okay, let's leave that there for now and let us discuss, uh, let us hear a word from our sponsor, Miracle Made. Well, the evenings are getting cooler, but if you have Miracle Made sheets, you will always sleep in the perfect temperature and comfort. Why? Because Miracle Made sheets are inspired by NASA and use silver infused fabrics that are temperature regulating so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. These sheets um, 
do not harbor bacteria like other sheets uh, because of this uh, silver infused fabric, which means they are self-cleaning and so they prevent 99.7% of bacterial growth. They're designed for your skin so you can sleep on cool and comfortable and clean sheets. And they have tremendous comfort. Miracle made sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five star hotels. Go to trymiracle.com slash beg to differ to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. Choose our promo beg to differ at checkout and you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident of their product that it's backed by a 30 day money back guarantee. If you aren't hundred percent satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash beg to differ and use that code beg to differ to claim your three piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash beg to differ. And we thank them for sponsoring this podcast. All right. Well, when we um, look at those undecided voters, uh, really when you look at all voters and you ask what is the most important issue that you're thinking about as we head into November, it is the economy uh, by, by a long shot. Um, and um, Trump still gets higher ratings than Harris in terms of people's confidence of who it's going to be better at handling the economy. So Matt Bennett, um, first of all, it's pretty clear that when people say the economy, what they really mean is high prices, uh, because the other aspects of this American economy are going gangbusters. Growth is excellent. Unemployment is at record lows. Uh, the dollar is high. I mean, we have all kinds of ind indices of success, except prices are high. Now they have come down. But um, what do you think is the best argument for Harris um, on this issue, which voters say is the most important thing? Well, I mean, collectively, we've all been in politics for about 3.8 million years. And uh, for, for <laughs> 3.799 million of those years, the economy has been the most important issue. I think the only cycle I can remember when it wasn't was, you know, 2002 and four, I guess, after 9-11. Um, right. But otherwise, it's right. always the case. Um, but for most of our time in politics, it was about jobs and job creation. And so I can't speak for Republicans, but Democrats have, you know, we had one gear, which is how do we create jobs? And we talk about jobs and job creation. That just isn't a thing right now for all the reasons you just articulated. The problem is not uh, prices rising dramatically now. Inflation's down to about 2.6% or less. Um, Two, yeah. It's that yeah. people are comparing prices now to prices in 2019. So uh, what do we do? I think job one is to make the case to voters that voting for Trump to deal with inflation is like treating your diabetes with ho-hos. What he is proposing mm -hmm. to do is uh, impose 20% across the board tariffs and 60% tariffs on Chinese imports. 20%. I mean, that is, uh, and they, they kind of went back and forth on this during the debate, but every sane economist will tell you that that is inflationary directly in proportion to the size of the tariff. The second thing they want to do in a full employment economy is deport 9 million people which is also inflationary because if the uh, person cutting the lawn is deported, you got to pay more to have your lawn cut. And that person who leaves their other job leaves a job that we have to pay more. So that's going to drive up costs and therefore prices. And the third thing he wants to do is take over as you know, presidential control of the Fed. And uh, presidents always, always want the Fed to cut rates, even when they shouldn't. And that would be inflationary. So it is the precise opposite of what you need to do to control inflation. So I think making that case is the first thing. And the second thing that she needs to do is to make sure people understand that she, 
you know, to use the trope from Clinton, feels their pain, understands that they are having a hard time and that she's going to wake up every day thinking about things that she can do to help them. She has a few proposals. Some of them are eh, some of them are pretty good. Uh, but I think mostly it's about making sure they understand that she gets their lives. Yep. Uh, that Boy, that covered the waterfront. Um, Linda, um, the one thing that Matt didn't mention, but which we could also throw into the mix is people don't realize this, but, you know, even illegal immigrants who are working in this country are paying taxes. Yes, they so. pay. They pay. <laughs> They automatically pay sales tax and real estate tax. If they're renters, right. they're paying the real estate tax. Um, but they also pay uh, taxes, uh, FICA taxes, Correct. because many of them uh, are working on Social Security numbers that may not be attached to them. Uh, and those are taken out of their wages. And by the way, for those even who don't have that, um, they apply for and get employee identification numbers and file federal taxes. So um, this is a, a canard that they don't pay taxes. But I think uh, Matt, you know, is absolutely right. Uh, the effect of getting rid of millions of people who are in the workforce, I mean, they make up a, a, a large portion of, of the American uh, workforce. I'm trying to remember the exact figure. I think it was something like 6% or so of people in the workforce are, are uh, not uh, legally in the United States. And you it's can't... more concentrated in things like home building, right? Absolutely. And, and yeah. they, you want to talk uh, about unaffordability in houses? Part of the reason we have more expensive houses now and houses aren't being built is we don't have enough immigrants to do those jobs mm -hmm. uh, because whole industries, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting up drywall, that's almost entirely uh, immigrant and often not legal immigrant uh, base. So, so that's a problem. I do want to say a word about tariffs, though. Yeah. You know, we all understand tariffs. Uh, to, tariffs you know, are taxes. Tariffs are taxes. Right. Tariffs yeah, we, are taxes. We, we say that. <laughs> but I don't think the average American understands it at all. So no. I think it would be very helpful if they had real examples. You know, you import, um, I don't know what we could even, you know, say cars. Or you, could, you know, this is how much. Dishwashers. 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 Dishwashers went Dishwashers. up by 200 bucks during yeah, the Trump bucks. administration. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's the kind of thing we need. The one downside on that is that the. Biden administration didn't lift all those tariffs. So, True. So that, you know, that makes it a little awkward. But I really think they need specific examples so that people understand if this man is elected and you need to buy a new dishwasher, it's going to cost you this much more. Now, they throw out the abstract number of 4000 more per yeah. family a year. But I think they need specifics. I need they they need commercials on this. They need to educate Americans in understanding what this means. So, uh, Bill Galston, uh, uh, tariffs or taxes is something that uh, people should print on T-shirts. And uh, <laughs> oh, I, maybe every Democrat should have a T-shirt that says tariffs or taxes. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the other thing that's so um, crucial is something that Linda, uh, well, maybe Matt mentioned. Anyway, the, the, um, the issue of, of the independence of the Fed. Now, Admittedly, that is not something that you can probably discuss with the average voter, but for for it is a very important matter because um, he, you know, Trump has explicitly said when he was president, he put relentless pressure on the Fed to lower rates for political reasons, which, you know, yes, most presidents want to do that, <clears throat> though Reagan didn't when he was fighting inflation. But anyway, um there is that tendency to want to manipulate the Fed for political ends, and that's very dangerous for the health of the economy. And it's it's not like a, a question. The fact is Trump has been explicit that he does not want the Fed to be independent. And uh, and Harris has said that she would respect it. So. Uh, so uh, as a threshold matter. I think we need to decide whether we're having a policy discussion or a political discussion. Up to now, we've had a fantastic policy discussion. Uh, and the analysis of what Trump's reelection would mean that Matt offered would parse fantastically in a Brookings panel. 
Uh, but as a political matter, I'm not sure it's going to be very effective. Uh, and if I could offer some personal experience to back up that claim, uh, as I think I may have mentioned previously, right before Biden dropped out of the race in a piece of spectacularly poor timing on my part, you know, I took a four hour drive to Northampton County in Pennsylvania, which is one of the two counties that switched sides between 2016 and 2020 in Pennsylvania. And I talked to a lot of different people <laughs> and I was stunned to discover that spontaneously in every single conversation that I had, the issue of housing came up as the number one problem. Now, why should that be? I picked up the Wall Street Journal this morning and read the following. Uh, in 2019, the, uh, the monthly mortgage payment on a median home was $1,500. As of this week, it's $3,000. The cost for an average family to, er to own an average home, as far as they're concerned, has doubled. Okay, and I don't care what we say about Trump's program. Uh, that is the reality. And I think that, I think that, first of all, I agree with Matt that there has to be some Clintonian, I feel your pain. But secondly, you know, she ought to take the housing policy that she's put on the table, expand it, if you will, radicalize it and and say, look, you know, we understand that the heart of the American dream is taking that step out of your cramped apartment with your two young kids into your first home. Right. That's when you cross over into a sense that you're beginning to reach your American dream. And I guarantee you that in domestic policy, my administration will have no higher priority than making that possible for the millions and millions of people, especially young families starting out who have been locked out of that opportunity. And, you know, and. Maybe we're not going to be able to do business in housing the way we have in recent decades. Uh, maybe the housing market broke after, you know, after the collapse that preceded the Great Recession. That's history. The question is, what are we going to do now? And what we have now when we're short so many millions of housing units, especially for young families, is just intolerable. And we've got to pull together as a country and change this before people pay a price that will lead them to give up on the American dream, which would be a tragedy for our country. That's what I'd do. Does that parse, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> well, we'll we'll ask uh, we'll ask Damon Linker if it does. And also, Damon, you could feel free to respond to anything that anybody has said, but I would also just throw this into the mix. Um, we we touched on the effect that a mass deportation would have. Um, as an economic matter, but we didn't touch on what it would mean, first of all, for the budget of the federal government to hire all of these new ICE employees and the, the cost of trying to, to actually go door to door and start rounding up people. The costs would not only be financial, but it would be psychic. It would be tearing families apart. It would be tearing communities apart. It would be the most about the most disruptive thing you can possibly imagine. Uh, there would be widespread protests of it. I mean, it's such an absurd suggestion, but your thoughts. Well, those are two very different kind of they are. areas of, of uh, comment. Uh, so I'll go, I'll briefly just say I beg to agree very, very strongly with Bill uh, on the issue of housing and how to handle it as a campaign issue. I mean, I agree with almost everything Matt and Linda said um, about Trump's inflationary policy proposals, but I don't think as a political campaign matter, that's really a winnable argument. It requires that the voters have at least taken, you know, a semester of, of uh, you know, an intro to uh, macroeconomics to kind of grasp 
the the second and third stage knock on effects of doing this leads to prices going up that way, and I think people just won't listen to it; they'll zone out, and it won't be uh, politically effective, even though I think it is correct. Um, and so I I agree also very much with with Bill's proposed alternative approach, which is. To acknowledge, I mean, it's really a two-pronged problem. You have interest rates being high to fight the inflation that is no longer present. So if the Fed actually does cut rates very soon, uh, then then that, you know, helps a little bit, although it's a little late for the campaign. But the bigger issue is is things like uh, zoning reform, uh, permitting reform on building new housing. And, but that is largely a local issue. So there's not that much that a president can do directly. But there is a bully pulp that there is there are expressions of I feel your pain concern from the presidential candidate that I think are very much called for. And I, I liked a lot of those formulations that Bill floated as as proposals. Make it clear that Kamala Harris recognizes that this is a huge problem and that a lot of people in America feel much poorer than they were five years ago. And a big reason why is that it costs a lot more money to to pay the bills, especially for housing. Uh, you know, Matt Iglesias wrote a book. He's one of the great champions of zoning reform. Uh, he wrote a book uh, several years ago titled The Rent is Too Damn High. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking here largely about mortgage payments, not rents. But rents are also up because property values are up. Well, they're related. Like, yeah, they're connected. So, like, some formulation like... The something is too damn high and showing both empathy and anger, kind of indignation that this is happening and vowing to do everything within the power of the presidency to fix this problem would go a long way, I think. On your other question, there is nothing that Donald Trump is proposing to do that fills me with dread as much as the prospect of attempting to round up literally millions of people, put them into camps and deport them. This this is a recipe for tearing this country apart. Um, it is a, a humanitarian disaster in the offing. As you noted, Mona, it would spark furious left wing protests that would be joined by a lot of like random average middle class centrist types whose hearts would be breaking over these scenes. I also worry about a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, right leaning Republicans wanting to join in kind of vigilante help for ICE in this attempt, which could get very ugly. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and as you said, the resources, I mean, one reason why we don't deport more people in this country is that it takes a lot of money and manpower to do that. Is that really what Trump is proposing? Thousands upon thousands of people being hired and trained and deployed with very little past experience in handling something as delicate as this. I mean, these people are undocumented, right? That's what we call them. Then where are they? How do we find them? Where do we turn them up? Who do we get to turn snitch? Do we create a, an immigra immigration Stasi in the United States? I mean, the pr if you think about it for 30 seconds, it becomes a living nightmare. And I, it, there is, again, aside from all the things I fear Donald Trump might do because he's an insane person and mm -hmm. wants power and will overturn democracy if that's what it requires to hold it. That's obviously not something he's running on explicitly, but this is something he's running on explicitly, and I, I, I truly do dread it. Could, okay, could I thank just you. interject real quickly, Mona, because yeah. I think he, he mentioned something very important. First of all, let's not elide over the fact that Donald Trump has said that this roundup is going to be bloody. He specifically said it's going to be bloody. And there is a Tennessee pastor who has urged men to get five guns and says Ill illegal immigrants are going to pay with their lives. And so this is already happening. They are already talking about vigilantes going in and helping uh, on this deportation scheme. And it is this is fascistic uh, in the the real meaning of that term. Yes, thank you for that. 
All right. Um, we will turn to our final topic uh, after a word from a sponsor. Uh, one out of five of us say that learning a new language is on our bucket list. Uh, well, if you want to learn a new language, you know that the best way to do it is to drop yourself in the middle of a new country and then, you know, just go cold turkey and figure things out. But that's not an option for most of us. But Babbel is an option for most of us. Babbel is a scientifically uh, developed language learning program. It's got the expertise of 200 language experts uh, ready to get you speaking a new language in three weeks. And the way they've done it is that it's all online and they help you with your pronunciation. I mean, if somebody wanders by the room while you're doing this, they might think you're a little batty because you are, you know, speaking back and forth to the computer, but it actually hears you and corrects you. It's quite actually uh, amazing. Um, and uh, the uh, there have been studies from Yale, Michigan State, and others that prove that Babbel works. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester of college. There are 16 million subscriptions. Uh, and uh, so if you uh, are planning travel or if for your business, you think it would be helpful to brush up on your foreign language. I decided to brush up on my Spanish, which I took in college, but have neglected. And it really does get you right into it. I, I found it very, very easy to use. So here is a special limited time deal for our listeners right now. Get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners. You go to babbel.com slash beg to differ and you will get 60% off. So that's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L.com slash beg to differ. And you can get 14 different language courses that are available. Rules and restrictions may apply. And we thank Babbel for sponsoring this podcast. All right. We now turn to our highlight or low light of the week. Matt Bennett. I'm going back to where we started with the dog eating thing, not because it was funny, but because it is profoundly not funny. What is happening right now in Springfield is that um, schools are being closed because bomb threats are being called in. City Hall was evacuated this morning. Haitian uh, families are keeping their children home and they're in hiding. There have been death threats. There have been vandalism. Uh, there's been vandalism. Um, it, there are real world terrifying consequences to this absolute calumny that Trump and his minions continue to spread. When he says it in front of 68 million people, you are guaranteed that terrible things will happen. And then, of course, there's the other case where the horrible uh, incident where the uh, undocumented immigrant um, tragically killed an 11-year-old boy in a car accident. And his father was forced to call a press conference to ask J.D. Vance and Trump to stop using the memory of his dead child uh, in their political campaign. And uh, this is really dangerous and terrible. And um, I think while it can be funny also in another context, we have to remember that it can also be very, very bad. Thank you for that. Bill Galston. Well, I'm going to cross everybody up and go with a highlight, although it's not unrelated to all the lowlights we've been talking hmm. about. Uh, my favorite sociologist is a woman by the name of Arlie Russell Hochschild, who has made a, the late stage of his, her career uh, a period for going to communities that have been hard hit and have turned hard right as a result, and actually immersing herself in those communities and listening attentively and without obvious judgment to what people are telling her about why they feel the way they feel and why they respond the way they respond. And she has done it again. Uh, she has recently published a book called Stolen Pride, Lost Shame and the Rise of the Right. Uh, the immediate occasion for this was the announcement of you know, a neo-Nazi march through a small town in uh, eastern Kentucky. 
and the reverberations of that announcement in this community. But in that, but she took the she took the trouble to learn the story of the community and how you know pride in being able to earn a good living you know is shattered by a deindustrialization de and that shattered pride coupled with the belief that if you can't earn a living for your family it's not anybody else's fault it's not the government's fault it's not the corporation's fault it's your own fault you know how that combination can turn inward you know become self-destructive and suicidal or can be turned outward into anger uh, it is a must-read book for people who want to understand in a non-ideological, non-formulaic way what is happening in so much of our country. Thank you. Linda Chavez. Well, I'm going to call this a, a highlight, but it's a highlight about a low light. Uh, and that is a story that appeared uh, on NBC News' website. It's called, What Led to Rumors Trump Shared About Venezuelan Gangs Taking Over a Colorado Building? And you may recall that in addition to alleging that people's uh, pets are being stolen and fricasseed uh, by Haitian immigrants, he also claimed that in Aurora, Colorado, uh, a gang, Tren de Aragua, uh, had taken over the uh, an apartment complex in uh, Aurora. And this is a story that's been going around. A friend of mine, high school friend from uh, Denver, uh, told me about it. She was absolutely certain uh, it had happened. And NBC has now done a very good expose of how this lie started. It's not true. Uh, it has. It did not happen. Uh, there are some problems with uh, some Venezuelans who committed crimes in the Denver area, but this story of a gang taking over a town uh, is simply wrong. And I would recommend our readers uh, to uh, our listeners rather to read this excellent article by Nicole Acevedo. Thank you, Damon Linker. Uh, well, mine is also uh, a highlight about a low light, I suppose. Uh, this is um, an excellent uh, essay in Vanity Fair that came out this week titled Behind the Catholic Rights Celebrity Conversion Industrial Complex. Uh, the author is Catherine Joyce, uh, who writes about religion a lot and is in a, very much an expert in it. Um, I, I have a few uh, disagreements with how she portrays some of this, but it is it is still overwhelmingly a really impressive piece of journalism. It's a long, deep dive into the stories of people like Candace Owen, J.D. Vance, Russell Brand, and many other prominent right-wing influencers, uh, as we now call them for some reason, uh, who have converted to the Catholic Church in recent years and are constituting not at all the kind of Catholicism you would see in the pews in your, your local Catholic Church, but a kind of online right-wing uh, version of Catholic faith that is intertwined with and in many ways indistinguishable from just MAGA republicanism. Um, and uh, her, her look at all of these different people and what they are getting or think they're getting out of the Catholic Church and also how it, it fits in with uh, trends in the broader Catholic Church with Pope Francis and the fact that he's despised by many on the Catholic right uh, is a really a, a, a real tour de force. I, I learned a lot from it and uh, maybe writing about it um, and aspects of the piece next week. So very much recommended for uh, listeners. Thank you. Um, I also have a highlight about a low light. <laughs> um, well, it is actually pr in praise of a piece by the great Tim Alberta in The Atlantic, uh, Why Mike Lee Folded. And it is a really uh, scorching piece of journalism where he uh, interviewed Mike Lee extensively and reminds us all of how Mike Lee came onto the scene. Of course, he is the son of Rex Lee, who was a very uh, prominent attorney and was a solicitor general in the Reagan administration. Um, I think he went on to be the dean of uh, BYU Law School. Anyway, 
very distinguished legal pedigree there. Uh, Lee Jr. Uh, started out as a senator, as, you know, billing himself as a constitutional conservative and that he took, you know, he was very much putting out books about the founding and the importance of our of our uh, legal traditions. And uh, yet, uh, and in 2016, he tried to lead a revolt at the Republican convention so that Trump would not be the nominee. And then it's the story of how he folded so comprehensively that he actually became part of the attempt to uh, steal the 2020 election. And it is, uh, it is a really, it's beautifully written and uh, just a case study of, of corruption really. And, and it's why, why he became susceptible. And as usual, the story involves resentments, feeling that he wasn't fully, you know, not respected enough, maybe some competition with a more successful sibling, all kinds of things are in the mix. But uh, just, you know, I, I highly recommend the piece. And um, just remind me that when Tim Alberta calls me and says, I'd like to do a profile that I run the other way. <laughs> With that, I want to thank Matt Bennett uh, for joining us and thank my usual panel, our wonderful producer, Jim Swift, and of course, our viewers and listeners. Beg to Differ will return next week as every week. 